Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for Alicia Elliott in conversation with John Isaiah Edward Hill. My name is Nancy McPhee and is the Art, Literature and Culture Community Librarian here at Hamilton Public Library. I am honored to welcome Alicia and John. After the introduction, Alicia will read from her book, A Mind Spread Out on the Ground. Then John will guide a conversation. On the right hand of your screen, there is a question and answer chat box. Feel free to submit your questions at any time and we will try to answer as many as possible after the conversation. Today and this month, we are honoring National Indigenous Peoples Day, which seeks to commemorate and learn more about Indigenous voices as a step in the process of reconciliation. I hope you will join me in listening and learning. I would now like to share a Truth and Reconciliation Land Acknowledgement. The city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1792, between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbours, partners and caretakers. I'm tremendously pleased to welcome our guests. Alicia Elliott is a Mohawk writer living in Brantford, Ontario. She has written for the Globe and Mail, CBC, Hazlitt and many others. She's had essays nominated for National Magazine Awards for three straight years, winning gold in 2017, and her short fiction was selected for Best American Short Stories 2018, Best Canadian Stories 2018, and Journey Prize Stories 30. She was chosen by Tanya Talega as the 2018 recipient of the RBC Taylor Emerging Writer Award. Her first book, A Mind Spread Out on the Ground, is a national bestseller. John Isaiah Edward Hill, he them, is an Oneida poet and artist from Hamilton, Ontario. He is Turtle Clan and his family's home community is Six Nations of the Grand River. The themes of John's work include land justice, queer and Indigenous liberation, and the importance of imagination. Thank you, Alicia and John, for joining us today. Alicia will begin with a reading. Uh, say hello, everybody. I'm just gonna, um, uh, read from uh, the title essay. It's the first one that appears in the book. Um, it's called The Mind Spread Out on the Ground. Um, and I wrote this originally um, for um, the all Indigenous issue of the Malahat Review, which was, um, I believe, the first uh, the first literary magazine that actually had an all Indigenous issue. Um, there have been more since then. I believe um, Green did one. I think um, a couple other places did them as well. Um, but like this was the first one, and and, it's, and I I think it's interesting. I just want to mention really quickly that. Um, uh, the reason that that happened was because of um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission issuing 94 calls to action of which Canada Council took on some of that and so they made it a priority to have funds specifically set aside to invest in Indigenous arts. And um, so I, like that is kind of why there has been like this, um, this real investment in Indigenous arts until recently that there was um, uh, I believe it was right when um, Katerina Vermette, um, who wrote The Break, uh, when her book came out, um, she had said that she was really surprised that the, um, the same publisher, which was House of Anansi, had published her book. And um, at the time it was Leanne Simpson's This Accident of Being Lost um, at the exact same, in the same month, not only like at the same publisher, but they were also released in the same month. And I, she was being so, like, she was so surprised by that because before then it was like, oh, well, we already have our Indigenous author for the year. Um, and then <laughs> there was this very widespread idea that Indigenous authors work was not uh, profitable, was not marketable. Um, Non-Indigenous people didn't care about it. And so um, I think that, you know, um, in the years since, especially, I just checked the, uh, the CBC, um, bestseller list this um, this past week and I'm pretty sure most of the fiction list is um, uh, is indigenous it has jo um, uh, Johnny Appleseed by Joshua Whitehead um, two Eden Robinson books two Thomas King books um, 
and I believe also the nonfiction one is is also um, uh, is also mostly indigenous, um, and so is the children's books. So um, I think that you know uh, the fact that for so long we were told that our work was not marketable, that people wouldn't want to buy it, and this was like a, 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 a like an industry wide expectation. Um, us now proving that wrong clearly um, kind of makes this case that isn't exactly uh, where, you know, I feel like it's important to note that Indigenous people are like when when people are using prior data, for example, to, to make a point about what is profitable and what is not, if you have never really invested in certain people's works or or, or allowed people to tell the stories that they want to tell, um, then that kind of creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you only have one book and you don't market that book because you already automatically think it's not going to sell, then that's going to be kind of what continues on. Um, and I think we've seen that that is once people decided that that wasn't the going to be what they expected of indigenous work anymore, it was reflected in the market. So anyways, um, I just wanted to mention that because I think it's um, important to keep talking about why this happens and um, and to look at also how it happens in other communities as well. For example, with black writers, with trans writers, with queer writers, etc. They should also have the same sort of support and investment. Um, so anyways, <laughs> but, um, I'm just going to have to read now. He took his glasses off and rubbed the bridge of his nose the way men in movies do whenever they encounter a particularly vexing woman. I'm really confused. You need to give me something here. What's making you depressed? His reaction made me briefly think of residential schools, though at the time I couldn't understand why. Maybe it was the fact that he operated his therapy sessions out of a church. That certainly didn't help. I wasn't sure what to say. Can a metaphor or simile capture depression? It was definitely heavy, but could I really compare it to a weight? Weight in and of itself is not devastating. Depression is. At times it made me short of breath and at times it had the potential to be deadly. But was it really like drowning? At least with drowning, others could see the flailing limbs and splashing water and know you needed help. Depression could slip in entirely unnoticed and dress itself up as normalcy. So when it finally took hold, others would be so surprised they wouldn't know how to pull you to safety. They'd stand there staring, good intentioned, but helpless, empathetic perhaps, but mute. Or, as in the case of this particularly unqualified therapist, angry and accusing. Not that I necessarily blame them. I've done the same thing. When what was left of my family moved to the res, we lived in a two bedroom trailer. My sister and I in the smaller room, my three younger brothers in the master bedroom, my parents had no bedroom, no bed. They slept in the living room on the couch and recliner. As one may assume of such circumstances, privacy was precious if it existed at all. Doors never stayed closed for long. At any moment, someone could barrel in unannounced. This meant there was no place for my mother to hide her illness. I'd mostly known her as having bipolar disorder, though she'd been diagnosed and re-diagnosed many times postpartum depression, manic depression, schizophrenia. Most recently, my mother has been diagnosed as having either schizoaffective disorder, which is a version of bipolar disorder with elements of schizophrenia, or post-traumatic stress disorder, depending on which doctor you talk to. None of these phrases gave her relief. In fact, they often seemed to hurt her, turning every feeling she had into yet another symptom of yet another disease. What these words meant to me and my siblings was that our mother's health was on a timer. We didn't know when the timer would go off, but when it did, our happy, playful, hilarious mother would disappear behind a curtain and another would emerge, alternately angry and mournful, wired and lethargic. When she was depressed, she'd become almost entirely silent. She'd lie on her brother's bottom bunk and blink at us her soft, limp limbs spilling onto the stained, slate-colored carpet. I'd sit on the floor beside her, smooth her hair, bottle red with gray moving in like a slow tide, and ask her what was wrong. She'd stay silent, but her face would transform, damp, swollen, violet, 
as if the words she couldn't say were bubbling beneath her skin, burning her up from the inside. Um, and I'm just going to move quickly to uh, this, just a, a couple pages ahead. Um, according to Diane Perkis's The Witch in History, Early Modern and 20th Century Representations, European colonists widely considered indigenous peoples to be devil worshipers. In fact, during the Salem witch trials, the people of the Sagamore tribe were blamed. Described by early Puritan minister and mastermind of the witch trials, Cotton Mather as horrid sorcerers and hellish conjurers who conversed with demons. One person on trial claimed to have attended a black mass with the Sagamore Indians. Mercy Short, another accused witch, took it one step further. She claimed the devil himself was an Indian, describing him as not of a Negro, but of a Tawny or an Indian color. Literal demonizing of indigenous people was a natural extension of early tactics used to move colonization along. In 1452 and 1455, the Catholic Church issued papal bulls calling for non-Christian people to be invaded, robbed, and enslaved under the premise that they were enemies of Christ. Forty years later, when Christopher Columbus accidentally arrived in the Americas, European monarchs began to expand on the ideas contained in those bulls, issuing policies and practices that have been collectively referred to as the doctrine of discovery. These new policies dictated that devil worshiping indigenous peoples worldwide should not be thought of as human even and thus the land they had cared for and inhabited for centuries was terra nullius or vacant land, and Christian monarchs had the right to claim it all. The doctrine of discovery was such a tantalizing, seemingly guilt-free justification for genocide. Even US Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson adopted it as official policy in 1792, and we all know how much Americans wanted to distinguish themselves from Europe at the time. The doctrine of discovery is still cited in court cases today whenever the Canada or the US want to shut up indigenous tribes who complain. In an attempt to stop this lazy racist rationale, a delegation of indigenous people went to Rome in 2016 to ask the church to rescind these papal bulls. Gunawage Mohawk Kenneth Deer said that after hearing their concerns, Pope Francis merely looked him in the eye and said, I'll pray for you. Two years later, after the delegation's second trip to Rome to discuss these papal bulls, they were told the matter was being sent to another committee. Nothing else has been done, though presumably the Pope is still praying for us. And that's where I'll stop for now. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I really love that opening um, essay and I remember uh, what I had the pleasure of going over the book again in preparation for our talk, you know, it really made me think about sort of um, sort of a discourse of like this sort of double bind that indigenous people have been caught up in historically. Um, there's essays that um, you write, you've gone to write about like the scientific dehumanization of indigenous people through things like nutrition and through, you know, there's, there's this like sort of like scientific deconstruction of the indigenous subject, like this like overstudying without representation, without the full social context. And then on the other hand, you have this socio-religious deconstruction as well. So this thing that we see as like this like stark binary between logic and science and uh, religion and spiritual spirituality, um, they sort of coalesce in like this this Venn diagram where in the middle is this sort of dehumanization of the indigenous person as a as like a singular individual and also as a collective as a as a as a monolith and so part of my question is uh something that i've been considering something that i've been thinking about is when you are um you know when, when you were writing a mind spread out on the ground um obviously you were sort of like very much focused on your experience as a Haudenosaunee woman um you know, uh, and 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 you were relating to the experiences of um, your family, and so 
but how do we how do we ourselves navigate those that double bind that scientific and socio religious um, or sociological like sort of deconstruction of ourselves you know we spend so much time ruminating on how we are dehumanized um, how do you how do you uh, how do we counter those narratives without using and resorting to those same principles without having to sort of concede ground to those concepts and to those things by giving them legitimacy it's almost like the idea that like there's no debating fascism because fascism is a zero sum game. It's a it's a it's a dead end, um, and debating those ideas of like far right fascist um, uh, tendencies sort of lends them this kind of legitimacy. Like oh, they can be defeated, they can be outwitted, they can be deconstructed, and they can be shown to be liars or people who uh, build their ideology on false pretenses. Um, so. You know, I guess sort of like my main question for you is, how do we fight this double bind? Like, with with what tool can we use to fight this double bind between all of these different ways that indigenous people have been deconstructed, especially Haudenosaunee people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think it's um, one thing that I was uh, just actually um, rereading was. Um, Rick Montour, and you probably know of Rick Montour, but um, if anyone is listening doesn't know, he's um, uh, just this brilliant um, indigenous, I guess I would, I would call him a scholar. I don't know if he would necessarily agree with that terminology, but, you know, he's like a knowledge holder. He's, he's you know, he carries so many stories. He has all of this, um, you know, documentation about um, our people, especially from Six Nations. And um, he wrote this book called We Share Our Matters, which is talking about um, specifically him looking at the ways that um, writing on Six Nations has been used or has been analyzed, except he's doing it from a Haudenosaunee lens. And um, and the in the introduction, I was just rereading this actually because I, I wanted to use a quote from it for um, an epitaph for um, the novel I'm working on. And um, one of the things that he mentioned, um, which is why I'm so glad that you said, especially Haudenosaunee people, because is um, that basically like the entire um, uh, I want to call it an industry, really, of um, anthropology was started through studying of Haudenosaunee people. Um, they called us Iroquois, but um, there was a specific book that was um, written, um, and I won't, don't remember the name of the guy off the top of my head, but um, he it was about Haudenosaunee people specifically, and there was this um, almost like academic obsession with our people, and um, and it's interesting because. Um, you know, <laughs> the funny thing is, is that while um, on one hand we had um, the Canadian government specifically trying to, um, at that time, uh, basically undermine us consistently, trying to um, uh, bring Christianity into the uh, into Six Nations, which they were largely successful on for a very long time. Um, for a long time, Mohawk chiefs were mostly Christian, um, and then also. Um, but like, but our people still had, you know, our our great law. We still had our chiefs that were meeting and things like that. So like, what what I found was interesting, especially thinking about our our people, is the way that um, even with these other outside influences and things like that, we found ways to kind of use it to our advantage to kind of um, make it into something that still helps us preserve things. And what I find kind of interesting is that. Um, you know, there were like, for example, um, uh, like a lot of the Mohawk chiefs when Descahe went to the UN um, or what would become the UN, um, when he went there, there were people who were like, our, like our communities are full of people who have all sorts of different ideas. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's this idea that, um, you know, indigenous communities are monoliths, that we all believe the same things, that we all have want the same things. But that was very clearly not the case um, at, on Six Nations. But in any case, when, um, Descahe went to the UN trying to argue that we were, um, always allies to the crown and that Canada was trying to force us to come under the Indian Act, they had, um, at that time set up an RCMP unit specifically on Six Nations to monitor our people. They were going through people's houses and taking cultural artifacts and things like that. And when they finally, like, um, forced the band council on, 
they locked the council house and made it so that we couldn't access our council house. And they took all of our wampum and things like that, things that we are still trying to get back, um, you know, from people that have taken it and then given it to museums and things like that. So like the interesting thing for me is this kind of, um, this, this thing where they, on one hand, like these colonizing forces want like recognize that our culture is um, something they need to destroy to destroy us and to take our land. They know that. And so on the one hand, they're doing this, but on the other hand, they're looking at us as like these almost scientific subjects um, uh, and our culture as something that they can like write dissertations about and profit off of in that way. Um, so I find it really interesting that the, this kind of double bind where like they, they're like, well, let's like study them, but also we want to make sure that they're Christian. We want to make sure we stamp out everything that makes them Haudenosaunee. And so like, when that is kind of happening, anyways, um, I think that like the, the ironic thing, of course, is that um, ultimately and in, in, um, uh, we've been able to kind of reclaim certain ceremonies or certain things from looking at those um, like academic texts and then reinterpreting them and and changing them. One thing that I think that um, is, I think, fascinating to me um, about all indigenous cultures, but, specific, but specifically Haudenosaunee culture is that we have always been, um, you know, seen the world and our cultures and ourselves as being um, in flux and changing and things like that. And so um, when I think of things such as like, you know, um, the prophet of Handsome Lake, who was, who, who, uh, you know, he, he was um, very much influenced by uh, the Quakers, but also he was able to convince people that we need to, like, if we're going to survive, we need to change and we need to have other things that are going on. So I think that one thing that I find interesting is that, you know, while these people, you know, um, uh, through various ways dehumanize us and then also, um, you know, kind of exploit our knowledge, our, um, our culture and, and, and other things like that. Um, you know, like we, I, I don't know if, if you remember back when uh, the Olympics were in Vancouver, they were using indigenous um, iconography, they were using indigenous dances, there was no Canadian anything, it was all Expro like exploitative. It was all like using us as a way to kind of thrust an identity upon. And so I think that one of the things that for me is um, is good to consider is that, you know, while we're talking, like it's good for us to know where these things started. And this is why I think it's uh, like for our people, it's always been so important to tell stories over and over again for us to remember these things. So to know that, for example, you know, um, that, that things happened, you, you know, um, when the Indian Act was enacted, it, things weren't ex immediately that way on Six Nations. They were, they happened at a specific point at 1924 when everything got all messed up and the RCMP came in with guns and literally staged a coup to get our traditional council out. It's good to know all of these things um, and, and be able to, you know, look at things like, for example, the Doctrine of Discovery and be like, this is exactly the moment where they were able to use these things. And, and that way we can kind of not only use their knowledge, um, not necessarily against them, I feel like to empower ourselves um, and, and remind ourselves that this, like even though it's like, it feels sometimes like this has been how it always is, it's, it's always important for me to remember that that's not the case, that there was an immediate start date, which means that there, and, and that, that also, um, Indigenous cultures are malleable and flexible and we can change them to what we need them to be. They don't need to be set in stone and like not changing because that's never been how our people are. And so I think that, you know, combining those two things, it's, you know, for me, more important for us to to know these things so that we know that they are, this isn't how it always has to be. That there um, was a time where there was um, a before this and there's a time that's after this and we can, figure out other ways to do things and look at things um, in not just our history, but also um, indigenous um, peoples within Canada's history, such as, you know, looking at when um, uh, there was the, you know, um, Art Manuel talks about um, the, the, I forget what it's exactly it's called, but like the trains full of indigenous people 
who came to Parliament and all of them were trained over the course of this ride to be able to be talk to the media about what they were there for. And that was specifically to put into like the charter stuff that specifically protected Indigenous rights. That was stuff that we did, knowing their like how they work and all of these things so that we can make it easier for ourselves in the moment while trying to do other things amongst ourselves. Because I think all of us know that like, if we're just gonna wait for Canada to, <laughs> to give us the money to, for example, revitalize our languages or do all these things, like it's just not gonna happen. So we have to make it happen for ourselves in various ways and using various tactics. I love the word tactics that you use that because it's really the idea of like a multi front uh, what, what, what would be referred to in in times past as like a guerrilla warfare, you know, it's like we you have all of these different tools at our disposal, um, you know, the Internet things that things that like nobody would ever really classify as like like indigenous coded or whatever but they but there are still things out there there are tools out there that if we get our hands on i think the idea that you that you emphasize Haudenosaunee culture specifically as this flexible culture as this this um this this entity that is not unchanging you know even um for example the idea the, the concept of the six nations is only uh it's only 306 years old uh whereas like you know like because like the addition of the tuscarora people um you know the people of my father you know and, and you know into the confederacy it was really an, a project of this ongoing idea this uh this like new iteration of this concept that had been going on and, and that was understood among all Haudenosaunee people, not just faith keepers or um, chiefs, but everybody, everybody from the top down and within this relatively non-hierarchical society, you know, there are clan mothers, there are chiefs, and there are warriors, but everybody is responsible for maintaining the Confederacy and keeping the keeping the good mind, you know, which is, I think is such a, an important thing to, to remember is that like all of our conceptions of who we are as a people and our original instructions and how we became the people who we are, you know, I think it's the perfect blueprint for malleability that retains that core. There's that core, there's that seed in the middle of this, of this uh, nebulous, um, almost like viscous, like outer shell. And, you know, the shell can, you know, be can can encounter trauma it can encounter hardship it can encounter barriers but nothing can stop the growth nothing can truly get at that seed that little tiny piece of us that has continued on through all of these years of col of, of of colonization and this this ongoing settler project that's happened you know and i think that um there's something that you mentioned, which is like the idea, which, you know, was uh, sort of tied to Rick Montour's work, who, you know, he was my, um, he was, he was a very uh, important uh, figure in my life when I was uh, doing my undergraduate at McMaster. And I think the strongest thing that I can say about uh, Haudenosaunee people is that as, as a, as, as a, as a distinct nation within um, the, uh, the wide-ranging and beautiful mosaic of indigenous nations across Turtle Island. Um, I think I'm I'm really proud of being Haudenosaunee because I can look at the some of the visual language in some of the wampum belts that we that we have records of and that have survived, and uh, I can take a look at the language and understand and dissect the language, uh, and I see this this vision not only of how things were in the past but also how things could exist in the future and this conception of the there's never been a more a, a more easy way to like sneak in mindfulness like long before it became like a an instagram or youtube trend like uh, I'm thinking about, uh, in particular, the belt of Hiawatha, the purple, and, and you know, and the the purple uh, a wampum with the white um, boxes and the chain and the and the white pine tree. And I think my favorite teaching about that that particular wampum belt, that particular treaty, 
is that the the chain which represents um, the four boxes which represent the four nations and then the middle nation uh, the Onondaga um, represented by the pine tree the chain extends to the very edge of the wampum belt because there was an understanding um, even within that visual language that the chain is not complete and that it would necessarily continue on and that there would be um, people, other indigenous nations, um, other nations around the world that would that would join the Confederacy, that would join under this great law of peace. Because it wasn't the Haudenosaunee law or the Haudenosaunee great law of peace. It was just called the great law of peace. And this idea that there's this idea of uh, there's this there's this concept there's this thing called peace that could exist and that Haudenosaunee people understand that you know the confederacy came out of war it was there there was a conflict between the original five nations and to and and I think that that's kind of why I think I'm not really against the idea of Iroquois existing, the word existing, because it comes from, I believe it comes from a misheard Huron word for snake. And and it reminds, and, and hearing about snakes reminds me of that time when people in our community, when the Confederacy was being formed, when the great, uh, when, when the peacemaker was walking, was, you know, assembling the nations and, literally you know taking the snakes out of people's hair and healing people healing the people you know at a time you know ostensibly before contact you know that it baked in and of itself is that we are people who have faced conflict we have faced trauma we have faced loss in the past and we do now but we continue to survive mm -hmm. and i think that um while while it's very attractive for um people uh like political scholars in the united states to tout these very well tread um ideas about how the haudenosaunee people influenced um early american colonists from uh william penn the quakers and even um to a certain extent the uh, american constitution and the declaration of independence um and our iconography is still present within those colonial institutions. You know, that's an interesting, that's like, that's a pretty interesting, uh, like, like sort of connection. But I think the true gift that Haudenosaunee people give to um, not just settlers, but newcomers and, and other indigenous nations is that idea of resistance and perseverance in the face of great challenge. Um, yeah, and and I and I and I I want to think I wanted to ask because you brought up Rick Montour. Um, what else have you been reading uh, while you are working on your current projects, and are and and how much of your reading is sort of stuff that fills your creativity in terms of like, your creation ability, and how much of it is just for fun or escapism or 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 what have you? Yeah, um, I just want to mention really quickly because I just, I just, I love geeking out about like Haudenosaunee culture, <laughs> other homes. But um, uh, just, I, I think that one thing that I just also love is the fact that because wampum belts were visual, there was this always element of art um, that was mixed in with our not only philosophy but with like basically what amounted to kind of contracts or treaty agreements with people. So like that, that was. You know, like to me, it it, it all like the, the way that art and and poetry kind of is is kind of almost central to our culture in a way, because like even when you think about the way that um, metaphor is built into our treaties, our our wampum belts, the ways that like you know even thinking of like the the two row wampum belt and like the lines, it looks so simple, but then when you like hear someone speaking about it and how, what those three lines in between or three lines of wampum in between the two lines stand for and all of that stuff, like it's just so rich. Like to me, I just feel like, you know, when I want to think about um, like our our culture and our, and, and, and art and everything, I think about like those treaties and I think about the, the, the speeches that our chiefs gave, which were so poetic and just full of um, philosophy, full of, um, 
you know, just such intelligence and understanding. And even like, if you look at the, like, just thinking about the great law, I know it gets into like, you know, like very, very like detailed stuff about like, this is what happens if this person does this or that, like if the chief says this and they don't, they need to get, you know, like the fact that they thought through all of that stuff, just thinks, just to me, just kind of highlights how um, holistic our kind of worldview has always been in terms of like, we can't just like, like we can't just have rose colored glasses on. We have to have protocols in place. If, for example, a chief is not upholding his, you know, responsibilities, it needs to be dehorned or like what was the process there and like all of these things, you know what I mean? Like that there was just so much thought that was given and it was realistic too. It wasn't like it was just like, you know, <laughs> like in Canada, for example, I'm just thinking about we're in Ontario and the fact that there's no mechanism in place to, for example, get Doug Ford out of office for the terrible job he's been doing for like, you know, during all of this stuff with COVID. There's no process for that. Whereas like for in our great law, there was process for that. There was like all of this, you know what I mean? And like, it wasn't just like one, like you're out immediately. It was like, we do this first and then we do that. You know what I mean? And so for me anyways, like what, what I'm writing right now is um, a novel. And so it's kind of, it, it's nice to kind of actually get away from nonfiction in some ways, but um, I'm, uh, you know, kind of spending, like I, I was doing a lot of reading about um, specifically uh, Sky Woman or some, you know, sometimes they call her Mature Flower from when she was like up, up before she became, when, the, when there were lots of women in Sky World, so she wasn't the only Sky Woman. <laughs> so uh, anyways, um, like, and just, I was just reading a lot of different um, versions of kind of what happened to her before she fell through because everyone knows about that but I just kind of was really fascinated with that and so um, you know I was reading a lot about different interpretations and what I love um, so much about our stories is that um, you know there's there are certain things that are like consistent but what is interesting to me is thinking about the ways that that story has kind of shifted based on context and who's telling the story and different things and so like there's per there's particular versions when um, like feminism was um, more, I guess, popular in like the 60s or 70s where there were versions of the creation story where, you know, um, it was like she chose to jump down the hole and stuff like that. And so there's like just the ways that our stories kind of can be malleable like that, like I said um, before. So I think that that's really fascinating. And I was reading a lot of that. But um, on top of that, like, I don't know, I guess for me, because I hadn't ever written a novel, I just was like, well, I need to just read a bunch of novels. <laughs> And so, and like kind of, I know that like people talk about how it's like terrible to like steal things from people. What I kind of do is like, um, I'll read something like, for example, I was, um, I knew that I was writing this dinner scene um, and it was going to be very, um, like the, the protagonist is an indigenous woman who's married to a white academic. <laughs> so, so like this kind of gives you some insight into why I was uh, using that um, that that little um, quote from Rick for starting the the thing about an anthropology and everything like that. But anyways, she's married to this white academic, and so she's at this dinner, and um, they're all kind of talking around her and uh, like about her in a way. Um, so, anyways, I was like. I want to kind of I, like when I get it gear up for these things, I like to read other people's interpretations of similar kind of scenarios. So like I was, you know, I read um, uh, the second book in the Rachel C Rachel Cusk's outline trilogy, um, Transit, because I had heard that there was like a good dinner scene and I didn't know where it was. So I was like, well, I just got to read the whole book, I guess. And it turned out to be at the very end. So anyways, um, that was kind of funny, but um uh, so like I, I was I was like looking at like kind of the way that she built tension through that scene and then I was also reading um, uh, Brandon Taylor's um, novel Real uh, Real Life where at the very beginning he's at this scene where he's like the one black guy with a group of white guys who are all kind of talking and there's that tension there and so I was kind of looking at like the, how those kinds of things unfolded and seeing what I could basically like kind of lift from them like oh okay this is how they created tension in this way so I'm going to try and do that in this situation um and then also um like it's a it's a weird book that does a lot of weird things um but you know I was also um because the character has is um dealing with postpartum psychosis I also was um reading the ways that um reading other books about psychosis which actually not there like there's not a ton of um of novels that are about that there's um there's some nonfiction, but even in terms of like specifically about postpartum psychosis there's not a lot of 
um, actual writing about that. There was one book that I found that was written by someone who had it and then um, realized that there was no real books out there. And so she kind of um, uh, had created the, like this uh, this group of, that was kind of a support group for women who had postpartum psychosis and then um, collected their stories, did light editing so it made sense and then compiled it into a book. And so that was something that I read that I thought was really interesting, especially as you see kind of like these commonalities between experiences um, and then also, so like I was reading all kinds of stuff, but um, uh, the other thing is though, is that like, as I was getting towards the end, I had had um, Eden Robinson's uh, last book in the Trickster series, Return of the Trickster, just kind of sitting on my like side table um, in my living room for so long. And I was always getting like, to ju into June, I was like, I just need something to like, inspire me and like reward myself for getting some writing done and so I started reading a bit of that and of course I like slammed through it I, I held off the last 50 pages until I finished the first draft of my novel which I did like a couple weeks or a couple weeks ago I think now so then I finished that but like it was like yes I get to read the last 50 pages of because I just love that trilogy so much. And I love Eden Robinson as like a person so much. She's just like the most generous person. She writes these lovely emails like that are so funny and just like so kind. Anyway, so like I just like I'm just such an Eden Robinson stan. Like I would like go to bat for that woman no matter what. <laughs> And just, I loved, um, you know, uh, the character of um, uh, Jared so much. Like, I just had so much love for him. And it was nice to just see his story all the way through to the finish. So for me, that was really good. And then it was funny because actually my friend um, was reading the, uh, the draft of my novel and she was like, you know, I was asking her for, um, in case you're unfamiliar, sometimes, or when you're trying to like pitch your book, they ask for comp titles or comparable titles. And uh, I was so I was like trying to think of some some uh, some comp titles as you're reading it, and she was like, you know, this reminds me a lot of the Eden of Eden Robinson's Trickster trilogy, and I was like, oh, okay, because she was like, because the tone and everything, and like, you know, we have that I think indigenous sense of humor that's very particular. <laughs> and, um, um, anyway, so I was just like really happy that um, that she saw that because I was just like, yes, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. I love that. Um, yeah, I I read the the Trickster trilogy while I was in my undergrad, and it was it was really beautiful. And I think yeah, there's something about um, reading book reading books by Indigenous women that just is so soothing and healing. Like, no offense to Walt Gashay Grice, like he he's he he's a lovely human being, uh, and 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 his books are amazing, but. Um, you know, like because I was raised exclusively by Indigenous women, you know, and like hearing that, hear like hearing like the, like their laughter and their cadence and their humor through their works is always often the the is is often something I think is like you know, very palatable and and I and sort of like something that's like very comforting. Even 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 a book like A Mind Spread on the Ground, which like. You know, has all these associations with you know trauma and stuff like that with it. I think that it's like there's a lot of phraseology that you use that's just like that makes me like really laugh, like like um and and stuff that makes me like sort of like smile. And it's just this idea of survivance is like baked into I think indigenous literature is that like you can be confronting some really awful horrific things, but also have this have this like have this like light sort of like it, it's like a it's like outlined by light because it's like it's a very dark cloud but there's this there's this very bright sun uh behind it and i think in your book um you talk about dark matter and i think about dark matter in relation to like the purple wampum belts and the idea that purple is the darkest shade that you can get natural dyes for for wampum and that in the belt of the high in the Hiawatha belt, the purple represents darkness. It represents not this not this cruel world that is completely out to get you and like you know, you know, and you know, this this, this evil world. And then like, there's this line of 
of of resistance. It's this. It's something more complicated. It's this idea that there's peace and then and there's and, and there's conflict. There's light and dark. And one of my favorite quotes um, is. Uh, from your book is maybe our single mind focus on the light makes us unable to see the dark that's all around always. But I also think that it works it in the reverse too, mm -hmm. because our overemphasis on darkness uh, uh, doesn't let the light in. And one of my favorite filmmakers, David Lynch, he's obsessed with darkness and light. And and uh, when I see like when you see like electricity going off in his movies or like flickering lights, you know you have this idea of like someone is manipulating and there's this flux that's happening. The flux is what's happening in the day to day when you go on Twitter and you doom scroll, but then you also see a funny picture or a picture of a cute dog or whatever, you know, it's just, you know, there's so much up and down um, in all of our lives. And there's no, uh, there's no better form of literature, I would say that embodies it than literature written by indigenous folks. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm super excited for your novel. I am definitely going to request a review copy for selfishly. Uh, no, but um, no, this has been really fantastic, and I can't believe it's quarter to four already because <laughs> it's it's just flown by. And catching up and hearing you talk about some stuff that you've been reading and stuff that you've been doing um, is great because it is much needed to know that you know there's momentum out there in the world. People are moving that, that uh, we are not, we're not, we're, there's there, even though it feels like sometimes you, we really just kind of go head first into the quicksand pit, you know, there's still resistance and still movement and there are still things to, uh, to sort of like go over and there's new ground to be tread. But um, yeah, I, uh, Oh, what I, I did want to know, what was the name of the um, postpartum psychosis uh, collection that you were reading? Oh, um, I don't have it. I, um, I Hang on. Let me just like really quick link. <laughs> <laughs> Google is allowed. This is in the quiz of of how of how cool, you know, and how knowledgeable we all are, you know. This is this is how like I all I have to write is postpartum psychosis book and this is like the only book basically almost that comes up. Um, uh, Understanding postpartum psychosis, a temporary madness. That's what it is called. And um, I think it was like um, uh, a lot. Um, I don't know if you remember this. There was this um, story that was really traumatic and awful about this woman who had um, had killed her. Uh, she had postpartum psychosis and she had killed her children um in the bathtub or something along those lines and um so like that was something that was really heavily in the news and there was a lot of people who were talking about it at that time i think right around when um a lot of these women were uh ex had experienced it themselves or were reflecting on experiencing it themselves and so a lot of them uh refer to that case specifically and so um anyways i just wanted to mention that because um uh i think that like you know one of the things that like kind of is runs throughout is this fear and the shame of you know your um this illness coming over them that um makes it so that like their the way that they're in touch with reality shifts and um you know i've experienced psychosis myself and um and other like you know scary mental illness not like you know the not like anxiety or, or depression or things like that like i do talk about depression like i said in my book but um, I feel like those are kind of the more acceptable mental illnesses because, um, you know, like they can be ignored <laughs> more easily than um, some of the like the scarier mental illness, such as like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, anything that involves psychosis um, or mania, those sorts of things. But um, anyways, um, just like that fear, I think was so um, evident of them being like afraid that it, that, that what had happened to her could have happened to them and then people would have been saying she's a terrible mother she's like you know this you know all of these things not at all understanding the way that like this woman is going to be suffering for the rest of her life because of she um she and she didn't get the help she needed because she had reached out for help numerous times and they had just said it's fine whatever don't worry about it <laughs> like, yeah. not, not listening to of course um the concerns of women because you know those are not um, those aren't important. In fact, I think it's really fascinating um, when I had learned um, 
that basically the whole idea of post-traumatic stress disorder um, was not even considered as something that was important enough to, to research or anything like that until after the Vietnam War when the vets were coming home and um, and World War II and everything like that when the vets were coming home and they were experiencing this like huge shift in between like with their mental health and everything like that and so all of this post-traumatic stress disorder um, research that had been done prior to that um, was primarily based around women and their experiences of abuse and things like that but that was like not considered okay to research it was only when it was a, a, like um, specifically dealing with men and um, men in the sense of like you know soldiers so this very particularized idea of not only masculinity but also um, having with involved with it this nationalist kind of narrative where they were doing this for the country right so anyways I just want to mention that but <laughs> um, yes okay there's sorry I'm looking at like the questions <laughs> yeah yeah we do have a couple of questions and thank you to everybody who's tuned into the conversation so far um so yeah the first question i see here you talked uh, about could you talk could you talk about how accessible art grants are for indigenous people especially if the process is only english or french this is interesting because i think um the context in which you and i first met was the bipoc writers connect and mm -hmm. a large part of the programming around that was around mentorship and this idea of showing up to a place and then meeting indigenous writers who are mentors or people of color who are mentors um, and then receiving feedback and then getting all this information about grants. And so what's your relationship to grant writing as an indigenous writer? Because you've talked about at the beginning how there's this investment now in indigenous um, in indigenous art and writing. And I want to know how that manifests for you and if there are any sort of like takeaways that you have from that process? Mm -hmm. um, uh, one thing that I will mention is that um, the Canada Council, which is um, you know, the federal body that um, deals with arts grants, Canada Council for the Arts, I guess, um, is technically its full name, um, but uh, they actually have um, funding that is specifically set aside for Indigenous arts, um, which I think is really great because, um, you know, there are always these like it's always about definitions with um, with granting bodies and therefore you know you have to do x y and z to be considered a professional artist and it's only when you be considered a professional artist that you can apply for these specific grants before that though um the one thing i i, I appreciate about the Canada Council for the Arts is that in their indigenous stream um, you can apply as an emerging artist and there are certain grants that are specifically set aside um, for through the indigenous arts section um, uh, that where you can, for example, um, get money to um, work with a mentor or something like that. You know what I mean? On, on a specific work that you're doing or, you know, um, or get money for like certain trainings or different things like that. And so um, I think that I'm really glad that that exists. Um, I, I do have some issues with um, the Canada Council for the Arts um, in terms of, uh, well, like, um, as that question mentioned, um, you know what I mean? Like they, um, because all of these granting bodies are, are running based on the idea that Canada is a bilingual country only, and um, therefore only English or French are acceptable as um, application processes. Um, to me, that's very frustrating because there are people who, um, who like, I know it seems, you know, like colonization didn't want this, but there are people who speak um, their indigenous languages and it would be good if they would be able to um, ha uh, apply for grants in that language and or you know if they wanted to specifically um, write something in their language and then like ha and then you have to worry once you're at the jurying process are they going to have anyone who's going to actually be able to read um, you know Inuktitut or um, or Anishinaabemowin or Mohawk you know what I mean like any of those things John, we did have a question there about the um, the Olympics because um, this was something that was mentioned. Um, do you have thoughts on on that point? Uh, in in if we can get Alicia back for the last couple minutes, then that's great. But in the meantime, to um, the question of um, seeing lots of organizations incorporating indigenous art and performances into their buildings and events, and and what are your feelings? What are your feelings on that? 
Uh, yeah, certainly. I can I can go into a little bit about that. Um, relating specific, I remember um, there was a lot of discourse around the time of the Vancouver Olympics and the indigenous culture and the and the overlaying. And during my my time at McMaster University, there was a great em um, emphasis in my curriculum within the visual arts um, indigenous crossover courses about the Expo 67 and this idea of um, you know, Canada as being this 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 uh, settler state that has this indigenous population, and it, there seems to be this kind of sense of ownership over that indigenous population. You know, Canada's indigenous population or Canada's indigenous people, and um, or First Nations people of Canada. You know, that that sort of language and that sort of um, that sort of framing of this sort of like ownership relationship has been. Uh, obviously historically very problematic, but um, when it comes to modern organizations incorporating indigenous art or performances um, at their spaces, whether they be art galleries or museums or um, even perhaps libraries, there has to be an understanding of um, the idea of indigenous artists and performers uh, uh, creating that work and creating those pieces being um in control of their own narrative and being in control of the process and for that process to not be exploitative um and that is a process of disclosure between institutions and individuals on that part but i find often that what often is missed in those in, in what, what hasn't been understood yet is um, institutions' relationship to whole communities. And, um, you know, as somebody who, you know, loves, um, who has a very, a very strong relationship to many institutions, whether they be, um, you know, um, museums or libraries or galleries, um, my, my understanding as well is, you know, aside from platforming individuals, what affording uh, um, what extensions and what goodwill is being extended to the communities that those individual artists and those individual performers belong to and my experience is that the uh, outreach and the um, the the emphasis on extending of the table to whole communities worth of people not just individual members who can provide a sense of uh, who can provide art in exchange for social capital on the part of the institution? Um, it's a great way for. I, I think. I think it's. I think there are strides being made to incorporate communities into within these institutions. But um, aside from this patron institution relationship, I would like to see these institutions, these buildings, these events, these um, these spaces, be occupied by members of these communities at the at the staff and at the internal level as well um and there is another question here that i could take another stab at as well uh at an online event with uh the hamilton public library uh shuri uh uh, uh Dimalini, um talked about how indigenous writers are creating indigenous culture and responsibility in that. Do you think about that when writing fiction? I think for myself, I remember hearing um, previous curator of the Woodland Cultural Center, uh, Rick Hill. Um, he once made a, a statement, which was that creativity is our culture, uh, our culture being indigenous culture. And I think about I think about that and I think about how important it is for indigenous artists as individuals to again be accountable to the communities which they come from and for there to be a really deep and honest interrogation of um, what stories we have the authority to tell as individuals, you know. Um, as a poet, I, I, I accept responsibility for the fact that if I represent indigenous culture, especially Haudenosaunee culture in my poetry, that I am responsible to my community to do so in a way that does not serve a narrative that is detrimental to Haudenosaunee 
culture in Haudenosaunee and the integrity of Haudenosaunee worldview. And so um, for me, it's really important to um, have that accountability and have that um, and have that and have that mindset. And so the idea that um, indigenous culture is alive, as Alicia Elliott was talking about, um, the idea that it's an un, that it's a changing, moving, living thing, um, you know, that it lives in our visual language, the visual language that we are creating now, whether it be performance art, painting, um, poetry, uh, literature, um, you know, it is living in those things because it's living inside of us. And so that is why there is a strong understanding about um, cultural appropriation, not just between non-Indigenous people and Indigenous people, but Indigenous culture, nations towards each other as well. And so the responsibility is is important and is and is um, in and of itself something that is always under consideration for myself, at least, uh, uh, very much so. And um, as an individual, there is so much. There is only so much that I can do to extend that courtesy to other indigenous nations and communities. And the best way to do that is within my own work, platforming the work of indigenous authors and creatives from those nations, from those communities, from those cultures. I want to thank everybody for for myself. Um, there is one thing I would like to uh, mention. Um, I would like to mention that uh, Alicia Elliott referenced um, being a part of Hazlitt's first ever all indigenous issue um, and and that what an opportunity it was. And um, I myself have had a work published in an all indigenous issue as well. Um, I was published in an issue of Hamilton Arts and Letters magazine and uh, uh, it was edited by a very good friend of mine, Johanna Bird, and it also features um, writing from local Hamilton and Six Nations and Southern Ontario uh, writers. Um, it's available for free to read on Hamilton Arts and Letters uh, website, and um, it is called Recreation Stories. And uh, if you would like to check out more uh, works from local Indigenous authors, um, please check out that issue of Hamilton Arts and Letters magazine. It was a great opportunity to um, be a part of that um, that issue, and um, yeah, I would love to plug and and to see and to make sure that other people are getting um, glimpses of other local writers um, who are in the community doing good work. Uh, but uh, yeah, for Alicia Elliott. Uh, oh, Nancy, would you like to sign us off? Everyone for joining us um, and we can see you again next time. Thank you so much, John. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, everyone.